Hi guys, so this morning I got a list of questions from a gentleman about uh, what got me started in ratting and why I have certain preferences and, and things like that. So if you guys are curious about who this mink is in my lap, this is little Mr. Wyatt. He's the baby mink that I've been raising this spring and he's growing up fast. He's not much of a baby anymore. So he's going to be here with us today for our discussion on why I use mink for ratting. So one of the first questions was how I got into ratting. So how I got into ratting all starts with my interest in mink. Um, I became interested in mink when I was a senior in high school and I moved near a mink farm. I saw these you know, long rows of cages of, of mink that were bred for fur farming and my curiosity was what exactly is a mink? Basically all I knew was that they were a member of the weasel family but I didn't know much beyond that. So when I started asking around what is a mink the replies I got were, oh man, they're the most vicious, horrible creature alive. You can't tame them, you can't train them, they're just impossible to deal with. So, uh, a little bit of background, you know, previous to this, I'd been a falconer for several years. I trained cow horses and cow dogs with my grandfather. And growing up, I had all kinds of interesting wild pets. I had a pet squirrel, a pet crow, uh, various different things. So, I was pretty familiar with working with animals, training animals, and more specifically wild animals, especially due to my falconry experience. So when I heard that mink were impossible to tame and impossible to train, the first thing I went to was, you know, I think I could probably do that. And so I basically started experimenting with taming and training mink. That was the first thing that got me started. So once I tamed a few mink, I then got thinking, well, what can I do with this little animal? I mean, they were right. They're pretty aggressive very, very uh, determined little creatures. I figured I've got all this predatory instinct in these little animals, what could I do with it? The first thing I thought of being a, a falconer was, well, I might be able to hunt with these little guys. So I started practicing hunting and fishing with mink. Um, in that process, I learned that mink were really good at catching rats. I used them initially for muskrats, but in the process, I started running into brown rats in many of the places we were trying to hunt muskrats. This led to some people asking me for help. The neighbors would ask, hey, you know, we've got rats in our chicken coop. Could those vicious little things take care of a rat? And I said, well, I know they can. Um, we've done it on accident a few times. Let me see if we could do it on purpose and help you out. And then I started, from those people, started telling more people about me and, and the efforts I was able to make in, in cleaning up the rats. And so they started telling other people who would call me and say, hey, we've got a rat in our wall. We can't get it out. We've hired multiple exterminators. They've tried poisons, traps, all kinds of things. They can't catch it. And I would basically come in and say, hey, you know, they would, they would ask, you know, what would you charge? And I said, I don't know. I, I just do this kind of for fun. And they're like, hey, well, you know, these, these, uh, these guys charge us hundreds and hundreds of dollars and they can't catch the rat. We'll give you a hundred bucks if you can get it. So I said, okay, a hundred bucks sounds good. I'd show up with my mink. And, you know, some instances it was as simple as turn the mink loose. The mink run around for 15 minutes, found the rat, killed it, and we were done. You know, other instances were a lot more complicated than that, but basically word of mouth got spreading around that I could take care of rats. And little by little, it turns from an interesting hobby into a career. So eventually, uh, I started adding dogs to the mix. I found that especially when there are high numbers of rats, a dog was really a vital tool along with the mink to take care of the rat problem. Um, when you've got a big colony of rats and the mink goes down a hole, the mink can only kill one or two or three of those rats at the most before they scatter. And if you don't have a dog there to catch the rats as they scatter, you're going to be at a pretty big disadvantage. And so little by little I added to my team different dogs and a few different mink. And because uh, I realized that just having one or two mink wasn't going to be enough for these big ratting jobs. And so it just little by little progressed from there. So I was asked which breed of dog I prefer for ratting and why. Well, I would start off by saying my preference is to have multiple different types of dogs. So one type of dog that's super useful for ratting is a lurcher type dog. A lurcher is essentially a sight hound crossed with some other working breed. Now it doesn't technically have to be a lurcher. It could be a purebred sight hound. Like for example, a whippet would probably work quite well, though I haven't used a whippet myself. I see others use them and I can see a lot of advantages in using a whippet. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a lurcher. Uh, it could be a pure sight hound of some type. But basically the idea is it needs to be a fast, athletic, long-legged dog. 
And so with that description, really, it could even be a non-sight hound or, or lurcher at all. You could have, for example, a Malinois or a, a tall, leggy border collie that's got enough grit. You know, things like that. Really, the point is that they're long-legged and they're quick. Um, and, and any dog needs to be gritty enough to not be worried about the rat bites. Because when you're catching a large number of rats, there are going to be some bites. Um, if you're only catching two or three rats, you can get away with even a pretty soft dog. Uh, it might flip the rat around for a while before it kills it, but you know, a big dog compared to a little rat is not a fair comparison. They're eventually going to kill the rat. However, when you're doing a big job, you can't afford to have a, a flinchy dog that does little silly things. Because while he's messing with the rat he's caught, other rats might be escaping. You want them to grab it, kill it, and be ready for the next one, not screwing around with the rat they caught for, you know, a prolonged period of time. Plus, it's not really fair to the rat being flipped around like some house cat catching a mouse. That's just not fair. We want the dog to get in there and kill it, not play with it the way a house cat does when they catch a bird or a mouse. Um, it's not only more efficient, it's, it's more kind to the rats. And you think kind being a strange word for using when you're killing rats. But frankly, there are a lot more humane ways to do things. And a dog that toys with the rat before they kill it because they're too nervous, uh, it's just not fair to the rat in my opinion. I really like a tall, fast-moving dog. Uh, there are a lot of advantages for a dog like that. For example, if you're in an open area, those rats will take off running across the open. And if you've got like a little terrier, for example, they can't run a whole lot faster than the rats. I mean, they definitely run faster, but it's not significantly faster if it's a really short little dog. And so those rats could easily make it to the hole before the terrier can get to them. Another disadvantage a shorter, littler dog would have is in the case of any type of obstacles. So if they're hay bales, garbage, tall grass, deep mud, water, all of those things extremely handicap a smaller, shorter dog. Um, in the case of water, terriers can be downright useless at times because a terrier would have to swim through water that a taller dog could easily walk through. And they're greatly slowed down by mud, snow. I mean, all kinds of things get in the way of a terrier because they're so short. And it doesn't have to be a terrier. It could be any kind of smaller dog. Uh, dachshunds are to the extreme. They could be the same size as a terrier, but they've got even shorter legs. And so they're even, even bigger at disadvantage. So I've talked about all the disadvantages of having short legs, you know, the lack of speed, any type of obstacle uh, slows them down. You know, one thing I didn't mention though is not only do the obstacles slow them down, they can block their view. If there's tall grass, bushes, boxes, hay bales that are taller than the dog or even the same height as the dog, the dog can't see over them. And so there could be a rat just a couple feet away running away, but the little short dog can't see it. If you've got a big tall dog, like I said, it doesn't have to be a lurcher or a sighthound, maybe a, a Malinois or a big tall uh, collie or a really quick pointer or something like that. Those taller, faster dogs can see over the obstacles to begin with and they know the rat's escaping and then they just easily bound or step over the objects to catch the rat. Uh, and so they have a real, real advantage in certain situations. However, there are advantages that a smaller dog has over a big dog. For example, if instead of it being obstacles that are, are need to be jumped over, what if it's an obstacle they need to be run underneath? For example, parked farm equipment, parked vehicles, um, uh, sometimes getting in between hay bales or, or other objects where they're trying to get in between tight spaces rather than um, jumping over things. If it's not possible to jump over it, they need to run underneath it. That's when a little dog's gonna be a real advantage. A little terrier type dog can scoot into some tiny tight places that a big tall dog would either struggle to move through or, or physically can't even fit. And so a little tiny dog like a terrier has a big advantage whenever there's a lot of obstacles that have to be uh, maneuvered through uh, rather than over. And so another advantage that those little dogs have is a lot of times they like to dig. And they'll stick their face down in the dirt and dig and dig and dig. Now, frankly, little dogs don't dig near as fast as big dogs. So their, their advantage isn't really that they're better at digging, because if you have a big digging dog, it's going to dig up a hole way faster and half or a third of the time the little digging dog will do. But uh, I'm just saying they like to dig. Uh, some, some of these lurcher types aren't big diggers. Digging in and, and places is vital. There are certain places where you're doing all digging all day long. 
However, if all you have is a digging dog in those situations, those dogs are so focused on digging, whether they're a big dog or a little dog doing the digging, if, if that's all you have, then they're going to be rats that are slipping out. And while the dog's got his head down digging, he's not going to see them running. So a big fast dog being there waiting while the little dog digs or the little dog pushes into some tight crevice or into a pile of hay bales or brush or whatever, having that big fast dog out there waiting to snatch the rats running from the little dog can be super useful. So what have I just described? Basically, I don't think there is a one dog that is the best. I think what's best is to have a mixture of different dogs with different strengths. A tall, fast dog preferably a lurcher that can snatch those fast running rats and a little shorter dog, preferably a terrier. I think Teckles and, and Dachshunds are way too short, way too slow. In my opinion, uh, they're very limited in rat use and I know I'm going to make some people angry by saying that, but I just don't like them as a ratting dog. So I would prefer a quicker terrier over a, over a Dachshund or a seal ham or any of those really uh, deformed breeds with the really short legs. So even terriers could be that way. I've seen Jack Russell Terriers that almost look like they're crossed with a dachshund, really short legs. I do not like those types. I want a more leggy, athletic terrier. Even though its job is to fit into the tight places, I still don't want it hampered by a grotesquely deformed short leg. I want it to be an athletic type terrier. Now I say that and I have Gypsy and she's really not athletic, right? But I would prefer, if I could change something about Gypsy, the first thing I would do is give her a more athletic body. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite. I've got Gypsy, right? But even Gypsy is an athletic thoroughbred compared to a lot of Dachshunds. So even though she isn't what I consider ideal, she's still better than like a seal ham or a Dachshund that's just an absolutely deformed mess when it comes to running and jumping and climbing over things. Anyway, back to what I say, I prefer a, a quick athletic type terrier and a tall dog working together because the little dog can squeeze into tight places that the big dog can't and the big dog can jump over obstacles, see over obstacles and run faster than the little dog can. And by working together, having the two different types, they're performing two totally different jobs which, which allow you to be good no matter where you're going. If all you have is little dogs, there'll be certain places where you excel at ratting but other places where you're at a big disadvantage. If all you have is big quick dogs, certain places you'll be at an advantage, but other places you'll be at a significant disadvantage. If you've got one of each or two of each or whatever, then you can cover any type of area, any type of terrain. Then when you throw a mink in the mix, then those rats are really in trouble because the mink can really fit in some teeny tight places and uh, outmaneuver the rat in many instances. So you use a mink, a small dog, and a tall fast dog all combined that's where you've really got the sweet spot. So for me, I don't like to use smokers very often. Um, there definitely are people who do, and you know, no offense to them, but for me, smokers have, leave a lot to, to be desired. Uh, one of the problems with smoke is it's, it's absolutely obnoxious. It, it gets in your lungs, it gets in your dog's lungs, you smell, they smell, it's just it's an obnoxious thing to work with and quite hazardous to the health of everyone involved. Also with smoking, it only really works in very specific situations and very specific soil types. I see a lot of guys over in the UK using smoke heavily and it probably works better in their soil, I'm assuming, because I've had very limited success with smoking rats out. Their soil is very, very wet. Our soil is very, very dry and porous. That might be part of the reason why people in the UK type areas use smoke extensively, sometimes never even using a mink or a ferret. Well, obviously no one really uses mink other than me, but not using a ferret or, or, or water to flush them out. They're almost using extensively smoke. Well, uh, that might be due to the fact that they have soil that, that uh, allows them to get away with using smoke. With me, where I live in the desert region, it's very, very limited use, and you can often smoke a, a burrow for hours and never get all the rats out of it. The other thing smoke does is it kills the rats if they don't bolt in time. So you're left wondering, hey, did I just kill a whole bunch of rats underground, or did they just find a way to avoid the smoke? You have no idea. You might have killed all the rats, or you might have killed none of the rats. You have no way of knowing. All you know is the couple rats who came out, and that's, you can guess based off of that. 
what I prefer to use rather than smoke is water. Now obviously that's not always available and in some cases it's detrimental to the place you're, you're working in, you know, making everything wet and, and sloppy or, or maybe degrading uh, a foundation of a building or things like that. So, so obviously water isn't a fix-all either, um, but you can use water and when water comes out, you know the burrow is flooded all the way. When smoke comes out, you don't know anything. Smoke comes out of one burrow and another burrow is, uh, you know, not getting any smoke. It's really hard to tell what the smoke's actually doing. But with water, it's very clear and dry. Hey, water is coming out of every burrow entrance that we could see. We know those rats are flooded out for the most part. So there's no rats left in there. They've either come out or they've drowned. With smoke, you have no idea. Uh, because smoke floats, it's just much more complex and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work the way water does. So sometimes we'll use water when we're not using mink or the other thing is you can't really use smoke in addition to a mink or a ferret for the people who use ferrets. Uh, you can't use that, you'll kill your ferret or your mink. But with water, in the case of mink anyway, I guess it probably wouldn't work for ferrets because they're not aquatic. But with mink, you can use water and a mink together, which in some cases is absolutely necessary. We've seen places where the burrows are so deep and so extensive, smoke will never penetrate them. We've tried that, completely useless. I mean, it might kill a few rats, but it's not fixing the problem. Water doesn't either. You put water in there and the way the soil type was and the depth and the complexity of the burrows, you could literally leave the water on for hours and it just seeps into the soil and goes down to the, to the aquifers below. It never totally fills the burrows. Or if it does, it takes such a ridiculous amount of time that it's not worth doing. So what you can do is combine the two. Um, you could turn the water on with the hose and put the mink down the hole. And because mink are naturally semi-aquatic, they don't mind getting wet, and they can actually submerge themselves and swim through some of the flooded burrows and come back up in the air pockets. And they're totally comfortable, and that's a natural thing for a mink to do in the wild. They'll swim through muskrat burrows where their entrances begin underwater and then go up to air pockets. So for them, swimming underneath uh, the water through, pot, through tunnels and such is a totally natural and normal thing to do. And so you can actually combine the mink and the water. And what we've done in these circumstances is the lower portions of the burrows get flooded, pushing the rats up to the upper portions of the burrows. So now they're more congregated in, in a tighter area. But once they get up to the upper portions, they'll look out their burrow and say, oh, there's a dog there. I'm not coming out. And uh, the soil in this case was really difficult to, to dig. So we couldn't dig them out. We couldn't flood them out. But you add the mink to the mix, now the rats are in trouble. The rats are saying six inches a foot from the burrow entrance. The dogs can't get them, but the mink can. And the mink will run down, grab the rat, pull it out. Run down, grab the rat, pull it out. Or swim underneath and kick them out, and they're running to where the dogs can catch them. So by using water and mink combined really gives you a big advantage in certain circumstances where you can't completely flood the burrows. Uh, I also like to have shovels because sometimes you're digging. Uh, you don't just let the dogs dig the whole time. You're digging with the, with the dogs and you can really uh, destroy a burrow system which many times is just as important as catching the rats. Now mink are not a fix-all problem. You can't just send a mink down a burrow with that's really extensive with, with a huge population of rats and expect the mink to kick them all out. Uh, that's why combining the mink with water can really ensure that you're getting every rat out of there. But you can't do that with smoke. You start to smoke a burrow and now you've excluded the possibility of ever using a mink or a ferret because you're, they'll get down there, get asphyxiated and, and die. Now once again, I'm not saying smoke's bad. Those guys who choose to use it, that's great. It's just not a preference of mine. Another option you can use uh, instead of smoke but doesn't work obviously with the mink is you can use suds. So sometimes in certain circumstances that are real difficult, you can squirt suds in the water and that, that will foam up the burrow and you can kick rats out that way. I don't like to do that. I feel like it's a little bit of a pollutant um, and uh, it, it kind of irritates the rat's eyes it, and I, I feel bad for the rats coming out with soap in their eyes and stuff like that. So I prefer not to use soap, but in a pinch, sometimes you can use soap. And if you get the right type of soap, it's, it's not as uh, detrimental to the environment. And you can squirt dish soap in there, the right kind of dish soap. Once again, it'll create suds, which will kick the rats out of places that the water didn't quite reach. Uh, once again, I use that as a last resort. I really don't like using soap, and I typically do my best to avoid it.
So some people may ask, why are you even after the rats at all? Why don't you just leave them alone? They're just trying to survive, those types of, of, of arguments. And you know, that's a, that's a fair argument. I mean, rats are really interesting creatures. I actually really like them. A lot of people assume I don't like them because I'm, I'm constantly catching them, but that doesn't mean I don't like them. I think they're a very interesting creature, very intelligent, clever little survivor. However, they are a non-native invasive pest in our country and frankly in most countries that they live in nowadays, they are an invasive pest. And they're actually a very harmful uh, invasive pest. Rats have actually driven more animals to extinction than almost any other non-human other than house cats. House cats are actually the number one most harmful invasive species in the world when it comes to uh, in extinctions, when it comes to driving animals to extinction. House cats are number one and their very close rival are rats. And the reason being is they're both highly aggressive predators and uh, in rats case they're typically killing much smaller animals. You know obviously cats will kill you know anything from from medium-sized birds uh, and down. Rats are typically focused on smaller mammals but they also raid nests so rats will go in and kill ground nesting birds and their eggs and, or their offspring and they can totally decimate certain species of birds uh, by eating all their young and offspring. Another thing they can do is they typically wipe out the native species of rodents around. So smaller mammals than themselves, they will quickly kill, wipe out if there are very many rats in the area. Uh, so seeing mice in an area where there are rats is really quite unusual and typically it's in little pockets where the mice are able to escape from the rats. They also obviously cause a lot of problems for people. The other thing to consider is that rats eat about a pound of food per month. We've gone to farms where we've removed over a thousand rats. So in those instances, those rats are eating a thousand pounds of food every month. And the food they're eating was meant for some farm animal, like for example, chickens or, or, or pheasants or whatever the animals they're raising on that farm. A thousand pounds worth of food every single month are just going to the rats. I remember one pheasant farm where we removed over a thousand rats and they said that they actually were feeding more food to the rats than they were their own pheasants. And when we removed all the rats from their farm, they noticed that their food bill was cut in more than a half. So they were feeding half as much food just because they didn't have the rats there. Rats are also being predatory, will sometimes harm our own livestock. Uh, they've been known to kill small chickens and obviously young chicks and ducklings are very vulnerable to rat predation as are smaller livestock like quail um, and, and like I said anything young and, and helpless is going to be killed and eaten by a rat uh, if they can reach it. And so in the end I'm not really, I don't hate rats, I just realize that they need to be at a healthy balance. And why rats get so out of control on our farms is what we've done is we've protected the rats on accident. So in the case of like a pheasant farm or a chicken farm pheasants and chickens, anything that would kill a rat would also kill a pheasant or a chicken. And so the best way to protect them is to, you know, set up a fenced area where predators like hawks and owls and coyotes and foxes and raccoons can't come in and kill the birds, right? But the minute you protect all those birds, you've also accidentally protected all the rats. So naturally, the hawks and the owls and the coyotes and the foxes would be eating the rats and keeping their numbers in a much healthier level. You know, instead of a thousand rats on that farm, there might be 50 or less, right? 20 rats, you know, on the whole farm. If there were predators able to actively hunt and prey on those rats. And so when you protect the rats, even though you're doing it accidentally, it allows their numbers to get totally out of control. All we are doing with our mink and dogs is we're adding a balance to it. So it's, I find it quite strange when people are so negative against our, our, uh, our pest control methods. Why are you bothering the rats? Just leave them alone. They're just trying to survive. Okay, well, if they were in a natural situation, they would be trying to survive with owls and hawks and mink and weasels killing and eating them. Why is it any different when we bring our controlled animals in, domesticated dogs and trained mink? Why is that any different? A coyote killing a rat versus a, a, a terrier killing a rat, there's no difference, except for the terrier probably does it faster. A trained mink killing a rat versus a wild mink killing a rat, I mean, literally no difference at all. Uh, so, so it's really a very hypocritical and strange argument when people say, hey, leave nature alone, let nature be natural. Well, hey, it's not being natural, it's being protected by humans. 
So we need to bring in predators, just like nature would have provided had we not protected these rats, and control their numbers just like nature would have controlled them had we allowed nature to, to act in its normal capacity. However, then people say, well, just let the foxes do it then. You don't need to get involved. Well, yeah, and then you have no pheasants, right? Because the foxes are going to kill the pheasants before they'll kill the rats. So I mean, it's, it's just a silly argument, and I understand people just don't understand the situation. Most people don't understand animals. They live in the city or in the in neighborhoods, and they don't have anything to do with livestock or animals or, or wildlife or anything. They just watch TV and get their opinions from, from TV. And I understand. When you have that limited uh, base of information, you can come to some pretty, uh, frankly, silly, to be, to be fair, silly conclusions. But when you have a base understanding of how animal and nature and farming really works, then it all makes sense. And you're like, oh, it makes perfect sense. Why not bring in some predators who are under control so they don't kill the livestock and allow them to do what wild predators would have done anyway, which is keep the numbers of rats into a much more natural, healthy level. Another thing that people don't understand typically is whenever possible, we use the bodies of these rats to feed our mink. Now, there are places where there might be some risks of toxins or poisons. Uh, if the risk is very high, we don't even go in there because we don't, we don't want to risk our animals getting injured. But if it's safe enough to bring in the dogs and mink, but there's still a question about the meat possibly being tainted, then we don't utilize the rat bodies. But in many circumstances, we know there's no poison or other chemicals on the farm that we have to worry about, so we can go in and utilize all of those rat carcasses to then turn around and feed our mink. So just like if it would have been in nature, the foxes and owls and wild mink and wild weasels would have eaten the rats, well, our mink end up eating them as well whenever possible. So one question they had is, why I use mink instead of ferrets? Well, uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to using the two different species. So I honestly have very limited, limited experience with ferrets. So I am far from an expert on the subject of ferrets. So some of the information I might be sharing might be a little biased or inaccurate. Frankly, I'm going to share to my best of ability the, the most accurate knowledge that I currently have though with my lack of experience with ferrets i guarantee you something i'm going to say is going to be a little off so uh, the reason i use mink is well i started out with mink for a totally different reason i wasn't starting out with the goal of pest control i was starting out wanting to learn about this interesting creature this interesting misunderstood animal that everyone said was too vicious to tame and train that's why i started out with mink why i continued with mink once it became a career instead of switching to ferrets was simply because I do more than just catch barnyard rats. We also catch muskrats a lot of the time. Um, we'll have canal companies and cities and parks pay us to come in and remove and control the pet muskrat numbers. Muskrats cause uh, serious problems in certain areas because they'll get overpopulated just like brown rats because just like brown rats we end up when we set up a park for example we change the environment and make it so that wild mink can't really survive there or at least they don't feel comfortable surviving there. And so the muskrat numbers will get out of whack. So what do we do? We bring in tame mink. So just like na nature would have had a wild mink living in that area eating the muskrats, instead we have a tame controlled animal that we bring in and does the exact same thing as a wild mink would have done had he been in an environment where he could survive. So it's really, once again, no different than nature other than the fact that the mink goes home and he's protected from predators and he's fed even when he has a bad day hunting luxuries that a wild mink doesn't get. Other than that, it's really a very similar process. Uh, sometimes we do help out, obviously. We'll use nets or dogs to capture muskrats that would have escaped. So in a way, there are some parts that are kind of unnatural, but really it is the most natural possible way of controlling their numbers. And in many cases, controlling the muskrat numbers is vitally important because, because all of their digging activities can potentially cause flooding risks. And, you know, a lot of people love to just point fingers and be like, well, you shouldn't live there if it's a flood risk. Well, you shouldn't have moved there. Well, great. You know, everyone loves to point fingers at someone else. What if it was your house that happened to be there and you didn't realize, right? You're going to give up your half a million dollar, quarter million dollar house just to convenience a muskrat? No, you're not. You're going to be a hypocrite. and You're going to say, well, Joe, can you come in and kill these guys, right? Like everyone loves to point at other people's problems and say they shouldn't have them or they shouldn't have to deal with them. They should just live with it. But as soon as the problem's their own problem, then they're all for fixing it, right? People are hypocrites. That's just the reality. Everyone's a hypocrite in some way. Others are just far more hypocritical than others. 
Uh, but when people are living in an area where the muskrats digging activities could cause a flood, it's really important that we go in and control those muskrat numbers. Now, just like regular rats, muskrats are very, very prolific breeders. So no matter how hard we try to control their numbers, we're never going to wipe them out. We couldn't if we wanted to, simply because they outbreed our efforts. So all we do is keep them unchecked. We don't we remove them, we don't wipe them out. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't. They breed too fast. But by hunting them and keeping their numbers at a healthy level, we can reduce the damage they cause with their digging and reduce the flood risk they cause with their digging. And so, back to why do I have mink rather than ferrets? A ferret wouldn't be very useful when it comes to muskrat hunting. Number one reason is uh, they frankly aren't tough enough. Uh, a ferret being used for ratting, it's, it's a bit of a hard job. And rats are about a third of the size of a muskrat and only half as aggressive. Muskrats are much more aggressive, much larger, and much more dangerous than a brown rat. And so, from what I've heard from people who have tried using ferrets to bolt muskrats, uh, it's a really dangerous job and usually the ferrets ends up dead or, or at least scared of the muskrats from a horrific injury they received. Mink, on the other hand, muskrats are their natural prey item. Mink are the number one predator of muskrats in the wild. And so they have spent, you know, thousands and thousands of generations hunting muskrats. And they've been uh, honed to that specific skill to the point where they don't really get injured very often. Uh, an injury while muskrat hunting for a mink is incredibly rare. An injury significant enough to even take the life of a ferret when ferreting for muskrats is incredibly common. According to the people who've done it. I've never tried it. Uh, the other thing is, even if you had a ferret that was tough enough to kill muskrats or at least chase them out of their holes, which I've heard there are ferrets that way, um, if you do have a ferret that's tough enough for it, well, you got the problem with they can't find their entrances. So mink has to dive under the water a lot of the time and go into these underwater entrances to get up in the muskrat burrow. That's simply something that a, a ferret is not willing to do. So you're going to have to be there with a spade and, and figure out where the hole goes and dig into it to create a place where the ferret can go and it's just going to be much more difficult than using a mink even if you did have a ferret tough enough to handle the muskrats so if i already have mink for the purpose of catching muskrats why have mink and ferrets uh, frankly i haven't seen a reason to do so so i haven't messed with it maybe someday i will have mink and ferrets combined and i'll use ferrets for certain jobs and mink for others i don't know but for the time being i'm sticking with mink so i hope all that information was interesting to you guys and uh, I appreciate you guys watching my channel. Let me know if you have any other questions in the comments below, and we'll show you more next time.